Good evening. Welcome to the Sunday evening worship here at Liberty Church of Christ. If anyone's here visiting with us tonight, you're an honored guest. We'd be glad to have you back at whatever opportunity you'd have to visit with us. Um, look on the, few in pr the pew in front of you, and there should be a visitor's card. If you don't mind, fill that out and give it to a member here or a greeter as you're going out. Uh, we also offer CDs, so if you'd like a copy of the lesson tonight or a lesson from whenever in the past, just get with someone here and we'll get that set up for you. Leading the song service tonight will be Brother Kerry Deaton. The uh, first song will be number 267. Opening prayer will be Malcolm Kirkendall. Closing prayer, Jerry Lindsay. A few announcements we have. The privilege to serve sheet is on the back table back there by Ann's office. And if y'all get that filled out, and we'd sure appreciate it trying to get everything scheduled as far as assignments. Uh, also, this is change up for the month of July, so look at the sheets wherever they're posted and uh, see if you have any assignments for this month. Burnsville Church of Christ, the Coming Back Home Revival is Sunday, July the 11th through Wednesday night, July 14th. That's going to be at 7 p.m., and it's going to have different speakers. Sympathy needs to be mentioned to the Doug Enlow family. I'm sure they'd appreciate our prayers now and this time. Spe special prayer request for Larry Sarton, Joyce White, and Tanya Martin. Uh, some more announcements we have. Meals for Peggy and Rex Huffman. If anyone would like to help, see Ann and she'll get you set up for that. Uh, also check your mailboxes. There's still some stuff back there. And, we just like to try and keep them emptied out, so we'll go ahead and start with a prayer. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we're so grateful for the many blessings of life. Father, we're especially grateful that you send your only begotten Son back to earth so that we can have everlasting life. Father, we're so grateful for the blessings you've shown this country back in 1776 that we could get our independence and we grateful for all the blessings you bestowed on us through all these years father we ask you to forgive us for sins we ask you to go with us through the rest of this life and then the life's journey father we pray that you'll give us a home in heaven that's our prayer in christ's name amen Two hundred sixty seven. Sing verses one and four. Just a few more days to be filled with praise and to tell the old, old story. Then when twilight falls and my Savior calls, I shall go to him in glory. I'll exchange my starry crown where the gates swing outward never at his feet I'll lay every burden down and with Jesus forever what a joy twill be when I wake to see him for whom Twenty-four. <clears throat> Twenty-four. <clears throat> Sing the 
birth and the last verse. <clears throat> Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God, born of his spirit, washed in his submission all is at rest I in my Savior am happy and blessed watching and waiting looking above filled with his good lost in his love this is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior. at this time mark number 10 is a invitation song number 10 after you have that please turn to number six number six and if it's convenient for you please stand this will be the song for david's lesson <clears throat> Anywhere with Jesus I can safely go. Anywhere he leads me in this world below. Anywhere without him dearest joys would fade. Anywhere with Jesus I am not afraid. Anywhere, anywhere, fear I cannot know. I can safely go anywhere with Jesus I can go to sleep when the darkening shadows round about me creep knowing I shall wake and never more to roam anywhere with Jesus will be Good evening. It is great to see everybody out tonight to worship God on this Independence Day. Appreciate it. Hope you had a great day and got to spend time with family or at least just relax uh, from the uh, busy schedule that we all live. I went to Deborah's, uh, me and Deborah went to her folks and, and I ate a hamburger, I ate a hot dog, I ate a Polish dog, and I went back for another Polish dog. So somebody said, how long are you going to preach tonight? <laughs> Well, well, we're going to have a study tonight asking the question, are we sealed? Are we sealed? Hope you have your song books. I've marked an invitation song number 10, and we will be singing that song shortly. But I hope you get your Bibles. Everybody get your Bibles. We're going to be looking at several verses tonight to help us to look at the question, entertain the question, are we sealed? What I have on the board is an individual with a seal on his forehead. 
You know, that seal, we, we seal things. Kings, back in the day, they had a seal. Maybe it was in their ring, or maybe it was a little stamp, a rock or something, but it had a seal, and they would melt a little uh, candle wax, uh, on a, maybe a letter, and they'd take this little seal, and they'd, they'd punch it in that wax, and that was the king's seal. And nobody opened that seal because it was the king's seal. If you broke that seal, then you were uh, stepping over your authority. That's what the seven seals are all about in the book of Revelation. With that roll that had those seven seals, it was the seal of God. And nobody was worthy to open it except one. And that was the lion of the tribe of Judah. And then when John turned around to see the lion of the tribe of Judah... He didn't see a lion. He saw a lamb. So the lion and the lamb are the same person. And of course that was Jesus. And everybody goes to worshiping Jesus. Oh, you're so worthy. Because you're worthy to take the scroll out of the hand of the one on the throne. And to open those seals. And the seven seals were opened. And the seven trumpets and the seven bowls. All in the book of Revelation. And when we see those, we, we look at this imagery. And as we look at that, we, we have an idea or try to come up with an idea. What does all this mean? And there's three basic things that people look at when they look at the book of Revelation, how it means. They, well, it's an historical viewpoint. The book's already been fulfilled. It was for those Christians in the first century. And you come up with ideas that maybe it was talking about Nero, uh, the 666, the mark of the beast. If you calculate that out, it spells Nero Caesar. Or maybe it's talking about Domitian, another emperor of the first century. Others say, no, it's not a historical thing. It's an unfolding through history. Every time they crack a seal, that was this time in history. They crack another seal or blow another trumpet, that's another period of, of human history. And it goes all the way through human history, through seven different seals, trumpets, bowls, and it culminates in the second coming of Jesus. And people who look at that say, well, the beast, the 666, the mark of the beast, that's maybe a, the Catholic Church or some other uh, entity. And then there are others that say, no, it's not a historical book with Nero and Domitius. It's not an unfolding through history. It's all future. It all looks into the future. and It's something going to happen. None of the book of Revelation has been fulfilled. It's all about our future. And we're all going to get a mark of the beast if we're evil. And we're looking for what that mark of the beast is. Some people say it's going to be on your forehead and your hand. And that certainly means it's got to be a tattoo. You're going to have to have a tattoo on your forehead or on your hand before you can buy and sell product. Or if it's not a tattoo, it's got to be a UPC code of some sort where you scan it and then it'll give you ability to buy something or sell something. And still others are saying, no, it's going to be a chip. A little computer chip that they can put on your skin and put on your forehead. And that's going to be the mark of the beast. Looking at it through these futuristic interpretations, you have to be very, very careful. I, I, I tend not to look at it as a future thing because it is only limited by our imagination. We can imagine it to be anything. Back in the uh, 50s, they would never imagine it to be a computer chip. Why can we imagine it to be a computer chip today? Because it's possible. There is, it's actually possible. You can put a computer chip in your dog under his skin and you can track him. And you can put a chip somewhere on your phone and, and you can be tracked. GPS can track you. You can find you anywhere. So now that it's possible, we, we think, well, there it is. But back in the 50s and the 40s, well, none of that was possible, so it was something else. Maybe it was a social security number. That's the mark of the beast. Maybe it was Adolf Hitler. That's who the beast is. Whatever generation you live in, you tend to say this is what it meant. And that's what the futuristic views always point to, your imagination, what you can say it means based upon your imagination. So I, I kind of stay away from the futuristic interpretation, uh, primarily because the book of Revelation itself says that the time is at hand. And that was written back in the first century. And he says, blessed are they that understand and keep. So that was written to the first century folks. They all had to understand it. They had to keep it. And they certainly wouldn't have thought it was a chip or a UPC code or a social security number or Adolf Hitler. They had never understood it that way. So you had to be very careful about understanding it for some futuristic or, uh, and, and your imagination. So what is this mark? Are we sealed? Well, let's look at the 
the Bible. Everybody go to the Revelation. Chapter number 7. And we're going to see that the saved are sealed. Now we're always talking about the mark of the beast goes on the lost. You know, people who are, are following the beast and the, and the dragon and the false prophet. They're the ones that's, they, that's going to get a mark. But, but did you not know that the saved are sealed? In fact, in Revelation chapter 7, beginning at verse number 1, these saved people were sealed first. They were sealed before uh, the, the beast come up with any kind of mark. He basically just did a copycat and, and said, well, if you can mark yours, I'll mark mine. But the saved are sealed. Listen to Revelation chapter 7. Everybody get your Bibles and read it for yourself. I'm reading from the King James Version, but whatever translation that you like. It says, After these things I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, and they were holding the four winds of the earth. They were going to let something go, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree. They're holding back judgment. They're holding back the wind. The wind's going to be let go pretty quick, and judgment's going to come upon the earth. But then I saw in verse number 2 another angel. There's these four angels holding back those winds. But this other angel came ascending from the east. But he has the seal of the living God. This is not the seal of the beast or the mark of the beast. No, it's the seal of the living God. And he cried out with a loud voice to these four angels and to whom it was given, listen, to hurt the earth and the sea. They're holding those winds back that was going to allow judgment to come to the earth and the sea. And he, and he hollered at them, don't let it go yet. Here's what he said in verse 3. Saying, hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, till you're going to hurt them, you're going to judge them, but don't do it yet until we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. We need to seal the saved. And then he mentioned in verses 4 through 8, who is going to be sealed? It was 144,000. There were 12 tribes and 12,000 from each tribe. So 12 times 12,000 is 144,000. But then, after he sealed these 144,000, in Revelation 7, verse number 8, skip on down to there, after this, or verse number 9, I should say, after this, I, John, who's seeing this revelation to him, he said, I beheld... And lo, a great multitude, which no man could number, of all nations, not just the Jews. The Jews were represented by those 144,000. But then I turned around and I saw every nation, all the Gentiles. It's sort of like when John was told that the one that can open the, the seals of the scroll was the, was the lion of the tribe of Judah. But when he turned around, he saw the lamb. Has it been slain? The lion and the lamb are the same. Well, he looked at these 144,000, but then he turned around and you saw a great number. So it's, it's the same. The 144,000 is the great multitude. And this great multitude was, was present. Let's look at, they were from all kindreds and peoples and tongues. They stood before the throne. They stood before the lamb. They were clothed in white robes. These are good people. These are saved people, folks. They had palms in their hands. Look at verse 10 of Revelation 7. They cried with a loud voice, and here's what they said. Salvation to our God, which sitteth upon the throne and, and unto the Lamb. Not just the God on the throne, but to the Lamb that was worthy to open that book. Look at verse number 11. All the angels stood around the throne and, and about the elders and the four beasts, and they fell before the throne on their faces, and they worshiped God. This was a great group. This was not any badness in it at all. No negativity. They all were good. And they all said, Amen, verse number 12. Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be unto our God forever and ever. Amen. And then the angel that was showing John around heaven, revealing all these signs and wonders and this revelation that he's pinning down, that angel... One of the elders, uh, he showed them the, the 24 elders sitting around. Well, one of those elders came to John. Look at verse number 13. One of those elders answered and said to, to John, to me, What are these which are arrayed in white robes? 
Who are all these people? And where do they come from? And here's what John said in verse number 14. I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. That means I don't know. You know, but I certainly don't. Well, the elder told him who this great multitude was that, that praised God. Here it is. These are they which came out of the great tribulation, and having washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Folks, these are Christians. These are you. These are me. These are the people who have obeyed the gospel, and we've been washed in the blood of the Lamb, and we're wearing those white robes. It's us. And what happened to those folks? They were all sealed. He said, hold back your judgment until I go seal all them folks. The saved are sealed. In Ezekiel chapter number 9, everybody get your Bibles. You go to Ezekiel chapter number 9, beginning at verse number 2. Many things in the Revelation is pulled from the Old Testament. Uh, Zechariah, Ezekiel, Isaiah, and, and, and different others. But here we have Ezekiel, chapter number 9, verse number 2. Behold, six men came from the way of the higher gate, which lieth toward the north. And every man had a slaughter weapon in his hand. Maybe he had a knife. Maybe he had a sword. Whatever each one of these six men had, it was a slaughter weapon. And here they came in. But one man, one man among them was clothed with linen. He had real pretty nice clothes. He was clothed in linen. And he had a writer's ink horn by his side. There was a, there was a, a bottle of ink. It was in a horn, and it was for the writer. And what you do, you take that ink, you dip your quill in it, and you write stuff. So he had this ink horn by his side. Now they went in, these six men that had the slaughter weapons, and then the guy that had his ink pen in his hand. They went in, they stood beside the brazen altar, which is right outside the tabernacle. Verse number 3 says, The glory of God of Israel was gone up from the cherub upon whom he was, and to the threshold of the house he called to the man clothed with linen. Not to you six guys, but I'm talking to you with an ink pen. And he says, which the writer said by his side, and, he, and look at verse 4. The Lord said unto him, that guy with the ink pen, he says, Go through the midst of the city. Go all the way through the middle of the city, through the middle of Jerusalem, and set a mark. Put a mark upon their foreheads of the men that sigh and that cry for all the abomination that's done in the midst thereof. I want you to mark the people that care about godly things. When they see the abomination that's going on in the city, when they see the abomination that's going on in all the country, they sigh about it. They cry about it. They're so sad because they're godly people. They are people of God that are so sad about these things that happen. He says, so when you find those righteous men that are sad about the iniquities of the country, here's what I want you to do. I want you to put a mark on their forehead. Now to the others, verse number five, that's the six men with a slaughter weapon in their hands. Here's what they said to mine hearing. Go ye after him. As he goes through with his ink pen marking the righteous people, you follow him. You go after him through the city and smite. You got a slaughter weapon in your hand and I want you to kill folks. Let not your eyes spare. Don't, don't say, well, I'm not going to do that. No, don't let your eyes spare. Neither have any pity. When you come up on there and you've got that slaughter weapon in your hand, you whack them down. He says, Slay, verse number 6, utterly old and young, both maids and even little children, women. But, here's the, here's the kicker, come not near any man upon whom is the mark. If that guy gave an ink pen on his forehead because they were righteous people, don't you dare touch them. You kill everybody that does not have the mark. They're the saved. These other people are the lost because they don't care about the sins and the iniquity of the country. He says, yeah, I want you to begin at my sanctuary. Then they began at the ancient men, the old people that were before the house. They started out at the tabernacle where the old people were. And if they didn't have a mark in their forehead, they got judged. 
and they got killed. The saved, though, were saved. They didn't, they didn't, they had the mark. They were okay. In Exodus 13, you're already in uh, the Old Testament. Go back to Exodus. Look at verse number 13, or chapter 13. Go down to verse number 6. Now, this is when God has brought them out of Egypt through the power of Moses, or God allowed Moses to, to bring them out. Moses did it by the power of God. But he's bringing them out, and before he brings them out, before the plagues, the last plague, the death of the firstborn, God told Moses that there's going to be a, a, a ceremony. There's going to be a, a Passover that you're going to have to keep. And it's going to be kept after I let the firstborn die. When y'all get out of this country, Egypt, you better keep this Passover. And here's what it's going to look like, verse number 6 of Exodus 13. Seven days thou shalt eat unleavened bread, and the seventh day shall be a feast of the Lord. Unleavened bread shall be eaten seven days. There shall no leaven be, uh, bread be seen with thee, neither shall there be leaven seen with thee in all your quarters. And thou that shall show thy son, you better teach your children about this Passover in that day, saying, this is done, we're keeping this ceremony, because of that which the Lord did unto me when I came out of Egypt. How that he saved all of us out of Egypt. And, here's the verse I want you to look at in verse 9. It shall be a sign. Keeping the Passover will be a sign unto thee upon your hand. And for a memorial between your eyes. On your forehead. That the Lord's law may be in your mouth. For a strong hand hath the Lord brought you out of Egypt. Therefore keep this ordinance in his season from year to year. Every year you keep the Passover, and that Passover, keeping his commandment, is the mark on your hand. It is the mark on your forehead. Keeping the law of God is the mark. Exodus 13, skipping on down a little bit further to verse 15. It came to pass when Pharaoh would hardly let us go that the Lord slew all of his firstborn in the land of Egypt, both the firstborn of man, the firstborn of beast even. Therefore I sacrifice to the Lord all that opened the matrix. The firstborn child is going to belong to God, being males. But all the firstborn of my children... I redeem. I'm going to save them. And if you do that, give me your firstborn to be saved. Here's what I'm going to do. Verse number 16. It shall be for a token upon your hand and frontlets between your eyes on your forehead. For the strength of the Lord, he brought you out of Egypt. Now, this was not literal. God never told them when you keep the Passover or when you dedicate your firstborn child that you've got to have some kind of physical mark on your hand or your forehead. He never did. He said the fact that you're keeping the commandment of the Passover, the fact that you're keeping the commandment to, to give your firstborn to God and dedicate him to God, that in and of itself is the mark on your hand. It is the mark in your forehead. Now, Jews, throughout the years, like humans would do, tried to make it literal. They made themselves little boxes out of leather, and they put it on their forehead, strapped it around their, their heads, and there's this little box, and they would write writings, scriptures, in, and roll them up and stick them in this little leather box. And this is called a phylactery. You've heard that many times in the Bible where it says they make broad their phylacteries, big boxes on their heads. So everybody can see him coming. Oh, look how righteous he is. Look how special he is. He's got this phylactery, this box on his forehead, and that's saying that he's keeping the commandments of God. God never told them to put a phylactery on their forehead. He never told them to put a box on their literal on their forehead. What he's saying is the very fact that you keep my commandments 
is the mark on your forehead. That's who's going to be saved. The people that really do care about the country and they are, they're so sad because the sins of the country. That's who got the ink pen mark. Not a literal mark. He's saying you care about, you have a heart for godly things. That's who's got the mark. That's who are sealed. Being in your hand represents your action. What you, if you're going to do anything, you do it with your hand. Whatsoever your hand findeth to do, do it with all your mind. When you obey God, that's the mark in your hand. Being in your forehead is your knowledge, it's your belief, it's, it's your thoughts, it's your allegiance, like we talked about this morning. When I have in my mind to obey God and to, to believe in God and believe that Jesus is His Son, that's the mark and the seal in my mind. And then when I go out and obey the gospel and I do what God tells me to do, that's the mark in my hand. So our belief systems and our actions, that's the mark. And who gets that mark? The saved get that mark. Not no physical mark. We're not looking at, you know, we always talk about the 666 and the chip. We're always looking for something physical. Where do you find the mark of the holy people? Who's talking about the mark 777, maybe? Who's talking about the mark of the... Nobody. Nobody in all of these books and all these uh, folks who are talking about the end times and the mark of the beast and 666 and the chips in your hands and for it, they're all talking about the mark of the beast, but nobody's talking about the mark of God. They're not, they're not saying that you got a physical mark. You, no, because they understand. Being sealed by God is spiritual. So if being sealed by God is spiritual, then why not being sealed by the mark of the beast? It's not physical. It's a spiritual thing, as we'll see shortly. Having the Word of God in your heart, in your life, that's your mark. Everybody here in the Old Testament, look at Deuteronomy chapter number 11. Deuteronomy chapter 11, look at verse number 18. Therefore, shall you lay up these my words. Put your words, where? In your heart. Not literally on your forehead or literally on your hand. Put these words in your heart. Bind them for a sign upon your hand. That they may be frontlets between your eyes, on your forehead there. Verse number 19, you shall teach them to your children. You're going to speak of them whenever you sit in your house, whenever you walk by the way, when you lie down at night, when you rise up in the morning, and thou shalt write them upon the doorpost of your house. Nobody's talking about doing that. Write scriptures on the doorpost. They understand, they mean the, that the words are spiritual. And they're in your heart. They're in your mind. They're not on your gates or on your doorpost, physically in your uh, box on your forehead. No, you are saved and sealed through the Word of God that's in your heart. Deuteronomy. You're already in Deuteronomy. Skip back to verse number 6. Or chapter number 6, verse number 6. Here it is. These words which I command thee this day shall be in your heart. And in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, when you rise up, and thou shalt bind them for a sign upon your hand, and shall be frontless between your eyes, on your forehead. And thou shalt write them upon the post of your house and on your gates. Folks, the mark of God is spiritual. It's in your hand and forehead, but that's not physical. Nobody's looking for a physical mark of God on your hand and forehead. Everybody understand that it is spiritual. So how are the saved sealed? Well, 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 22. Go to the New Testament now. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 22. Who God hath also sealed us? The saved. We are sealed. Is it in our hand? No, I don't see a seal in my hand. Is it in my forehead? No, it's not there. How did he seal us then? He gave us the earnest of the Spirit in our hearts. If we have the Holy Spirit in our hearts, in our minds, 
then we are sealed. Ephesians chapter 1, verse number 13. In whom you also trusted, after that you heard the word of truth. Now, who gives the word of truth? Of course, the Holy Spirit does. God gave the Holy Spirit to inspire man to write the Bible. And as we study the Bible, the words, the commandments, we put them in our hearts and minds, and we go out there and do, we obey the words of God through the Bible. So he tells us in Ephesians 1.13, After that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, after that you believed, what happened? You were sealed. You were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. The saved are sealed. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30, a few chapters later. Grieve not the Holy Spirit of God. Don't go out there and think thoughts that are not according to the God's Holy Spirit. It grieves the Holy Spirit. Don't go out there with your hand and do things that are uh, against God's will. It grieves the Holy Spirit. Grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. The saved are sealed. And I'm not looking for a physical seal on my hand or on my forehead. But the lost are sealed. And unfortunately, so many people are looking for a physical hand and forehead sign. These are the people that have the mark of the beast. And they miss the point. They're not looking for the saved sealed out there. They're only looking for the lost sealed out there physically. The saved are sealed spiritually, and the lost are sealed spiritually. Listen to Romans. Everybody go to Romans. Chapter number 8, verse number 9. Romans 8, verse 9. But you are not in the flesh. No, you're in the spirit. So you are, the, you are the saved who are sealed by the Spirit. If so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now if any man, listen, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, you don't have the Holy Spirit of Christ or the, the, the thoughts of Christ, the actions of Christ in your forehead and hand. No, if you don't have that, then what are you? He says, you are none of His. You don't belong to Christ. So if you don't have the seal in your hand and forehead of Christ, then you don't belong to Him. So you must have the seal of something else, something evil. So everybody go to the Revelation to help tell us what that is. Revelation chapter 13, verse number 15. He had power to give life unto the image of the beast. That the image of the beast should both speak, there's that word again, speak evil things, talk about evil things, tell us about evil things, and cause that as many as would not worship. Ah, worship. That's all part of a spiritual action. So as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. All the devil is doing is a copycat. God said, if you don't have the mark of God, you're going to be killed. Satan said in Revelation 13, if you don't have my mark, the mark of the beast, you'll be killed. He's just copying what God already said. He's, he's inverting it. But he goes on to say in verse 16, he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their hand and in their foreheads. And there's where everybody wants to jump on that verse and say, it's physical. Oh, it's a physical mark in your hand. It's a physical mark in your forehead. You've got to watch out for that computer chip. But they missed the point. God sealed with spirit. This is what Satan does. He said, if you don't have the spirit, then you belong to the beast. You have the mark of the beast. It's a spiritual thing. In the Revelation, chapter number 9, verse number 4. Revelation 9, verse 4. It was commanded them that they should not hurt the grass of the earth, 
nor any green thing, nor any tree, but only those men which have not the seal of God in their foreheads. Now, folks, I do not have a physical seal of God in my forehead. I do not have a physical seal of God in my right hand. But there's coming a day, according to Revelation 9 verse 4, that they would not hurt or bring into judgment until they had that mark. And in verse 9, or chapter 9 verse 4, he says, you're not going to be hurt, but you will hurt those people that don't have the seal of God in their forehead. So since I don't have a physical seal of God in my forehead, right hand and in my forehead then I'm going to get killed according to that verse the point is I do have the seal of God we're sealed by his Holy Spirit so the answer to the question are we sealed is yes if we're lost we're sealed if we're saved we're sealed what are we sealed by and the difference is spiritual. In Galatians chapter 5, verse number 19, we're going to talk about, just for a second, the seal of the beast and the seal of God. And here it is. Galatians 5, verse 19. Now the works of the flesh are manifest. It's obvious. Here they are. If you've committed adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulation, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and such like, of the which I tell you, as I have also told you in times past, that they which do these things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Because they that do this thing have the mark in their hand. They're doing these evil things. They have the mark in their, between their eyes, in their heart. They, they think about envy, hate, variances, and revelings all the time. They are sealed with the mark of the beast. On the other hand, verse number 22 of Galatians 5, but the fruit of the Spirit, the people who are sealed by the Spirit, here they are, love, joy, Peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against us there is no law. And they that are Christ's have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. If we live in the Spirit, let us walk in the Spirit. If I live in the Spirit, then it's sealed on my right hand. I'm doing. If I live in the Spirit, then it's in my mind and my heart. Folks, if we hear the word of God and we believe it with all of our heart, we repent of our sins, we confess that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, we're baptized into Christ, we do that, and we live faithfully, we are sealed. The Holy Spirit, make sure of that. But if we say no to this plan, and we say, I'm just not going to do any of that. I, I might believe a little while, but I'm not going to repent of that sin in my life, that adultery, that fornication, that envying, that hatred, and all that. I'm going to keep it in my mind. I'm going to keep doing it. Then we're sealed. But we're sealed by the beast. It's a spiritual thing. Now, if somebody comes up and says, David Conley, I'm going to put a chip in your forehead. I may say, no. <laughs> I'm not taking that chip. Now, not for reasons of spiritual things, but maybe there's some things, other things I won't take it for. But we've got to understand. What's in our forehead and what's in our hand is what we do, what we think, what we believe. If you're here tonight, and you want to be sealed, you're going to be sealed. We're all sealed. The lost are sealed, the saved are sealed. But if you want to be sealed by the Spirit of God and walk after the words of His commandments, you can come forward. We'll baptize you tonight. We've got the water ready. It's warm. We've got clothes ready. We'll baptize you into Christ for the remission of your sins. You raise to walk a new life. You will be sealed. You will be marked spiritually. But if you say, no, I'm not going to do that, you'll be marked that's true. You say, well, I've been baptized. I, I, I've obeyed this, but I've fallen away. I've gotten away from God. You need that mark back in your hand. Do it. You need it back in your mind, believing. Why don't you make the decision to be sealed? Oh, we're all sealed. 
The big question, the real question, is what seal is in your hand? What seal is in your forehead? Be sure it's the seal of God. Why don't you come? Why together we stand and sing? The Savior says, Come, the cross where he died is in sight. He now at the cross there is room. Are you coming to Jesus tonight? Are you coming to Jesus tonight? So glad that everybody made it out on this holiday to worship God at 6 p.m. You made that choice. You pledged that allegiance. And, and I know that you and I, we all want to have the seal of God. Because if we don't, then we, we don't have hope. We cannot enter the kingdom. But we do. And we are so glad to talk about that. And we can rejoice because we are independent and free. Not just from a physical country point of view. We're free in the spirit, free from our sins, and we have that to be thankful for. If you're here tonight and you haven't had an opportunity to take the Lord's Supper, that's something that we do every Sunday. We sing, pray, preach, take the Lord's Supper, and give, those five things. And if you haven't had the opportunity, go to the room to my left and your right, and somebody will serve you there following the closing prayer. So good to see everybody out tonight. Our closing song, number 220. We'll sing the first verse of number 220. We'll have our closing prayer. 220. <clears throat> Take the name of Jesus with you, child of sorrow and of woe. It will joy and comfort give you. Take
Heavenly Father, we're indeed thankful for this another Lord's Day. We're thankful that we've had this privilege to come and worship you in spirit and truth. Heavenly Father, as this is another Fourth of July holiday, we ask you to protect the ones on the road, keep them safe, get them home safe. Forgive us of all of our unforgiven sins. Guard, guide, and direct us, and give us a home in heaven with thee. I ask these blessings all in Christ's name. Amen. 